Welcome to Construction Genius. This is Eric Anderton, and my guest today is Bill Schultz. Bill is the president of Schultz Heavy Civil Construction out of New York. And this is going to be part one of a two-part interview with Bill. And today we're going to be talking about the 22 service standards that he has developed in his organization that he communicates throughout his organization as the cornerstone of how he runs his business. And what I want you to notice in this particular interview is the process that Bill went about to develop the service standards. And we're going to be talking about the history of his company. He's been in business for 20 years. He's been in construction for 40 years. And so there's a lot of insight that you can glean from this, particularly in light of the process. So please listen carefully because you're going to get some very practical takeaways that could impact the way you run your construction company quite significantly. The second part of the interview will be coming out in a little bit, and we're going to be diving into the history of Bill's relationship working in his father's business prior to starting his own business in 2000. So enjoy my conversation here today with Bill, and please share this interview with other people. I think you'll find it very useful. In the show notes is a link to Bill's 22 service standards that you'll want to check out, not so that you can necessarily imitate them, but so that you can get the principles of what he's driving after, so that you can begin to think about how you might use a similar process in your organization. That's the point of our discussion today. So I appreciate you listening to Construction Genius. Please give us a rating and review wherever you get your podcasts, and that is really helps us to be seen on the interwebs so that the show can continue to grow in its impact. That's the whole purpose of the Construction Genius podcast. Thanks again for listening. Enjoy my discussion with Bill. This is Eric Anderton, and you're listening to Construction Genius, a leadership masterclass. Thomas Edison said that genius is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. If you're a construction leader, you know all about the perspiration, and this show is all about the 1% inspiration that you can add to your hard work to help you to improve your leadership. I'm, I'm really fascinated. You recent In the recent email, you sent over to me the 22 service standards that drive your business. We're going to spend some time here today just getting into that and and why you have those and how they operate in your business. But I'd like, Bill, to explore this idea of the service standards that you've developed. And you developed 22 service standards for the way that you run your business. And you're now in your 20th year of being in business, your own business. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. So, So let me ask you first then, these 22 service standards, how did you begin to develop them for your company? Okay, and I'm going to to uh, drop back and explain that for the first eight years I was in business, I didn't have any core values written down or any service standards written down. It was all in me, and I was part of everything that occurred in the business. And I I wasn't I didn't even think about setting the business up to have those kind of things in writing. Then in 2009, the recession took impact on our business, and I made a mistake. But it's important that I share with you this mistake I made in 2009. In 2009, instead of setting up an appropriate company vision based upon similar things that I have set this up today, I set a company vision that our company will be a $30 million construction company in three years in the middle of a recession. And that was in 2009. We had just finished up doing $12 million in revenue. And I said, we need a big, hairy, audacious goal to be a $30 million company in three years. And I put it in writing and I made it the vision statement. I hung in my office. I went around to job sites and talked to people. We had my brother, Louie, was working for us down in North Carolina. I I, I went down there to, to give him a review and I shared it with him and I just shared it with everybody. And we also had some core values that I shared with people. Why do you say that it was a mistake to set that vision of being a $30 million company in three years, going from 12 to $30 million? It was a mistake because we achieved it in two years. We, in, in, in 2010, we went from doing 12 million to 22 million. And then in, in, in the next year, 2011, we did 36 million. Then we did 38 million. Then we did 43 million. The reason I said it was a mistake is that we met the vision in two years. And then after we met the vision, what next? 
what is the right. company what is the company now looking at and, the, and and I didn't reset it we just we just kept building this wave and then it seemed like oh after we hit the 36 million oh we already met the goal well, let's not think about that let's just keep moving on because things are going pretty well so is the mistake making the the goal a metric a, a particular yeah. number was that the mistake that's the mistake the mistake is making it a dollar value a revenue number Okay, so so then let's sort of a sales goal, not not company vision. Okay, so underneath the company vision, there there should have been that sales goal. So, what did you learn from that mistake? If you had to do it again differently, well, I I, I lived through that period, which was about five years, where the company kept growing, and and then and, and and keep in mind that I was involved personally for the first eight years, so. The, the company vision was intact all around. But then when the company kept growing, the original company vision of customer service in our niche, what our core values was dissipated. Now, hold on a second. Let me just ask you, when, when you started, you were, I, if I heard you right earlier, you had all of this stuff in you, but it wasn't necessarily written out. When did you first write it out? I, I began to first write it out in 2009. That's interesting. So, see, and I think this is true with a lot of companies is that it's in the heart or in the mind of, of the, the founders of the company. And it's then therefore expressed in the way that they behave and the way the company builds, but it's not necessarily clearly articulated. That's correct. Well, let me ask you this then. What, what was the impact when you began to articulate it, what did you notice changed in your business when you began to clearly state this is our mission or vision or values? Tell me about that, please. Well, at first, I, I personally began to feel much better about the business when I would go to work every day because it now has a very clear vision and it has core values and it has sales goals and it has it has a marketing strategy and, and it has a 10-year focus and it has three-year business goal and one-year business goal. And I felt really good about it and it was very organized and I felt like it was sustainable. And we pushed it down through and through our leadership team and then out into other groups in the business. And yet it it, it really didn't stick. It meaning that it, it didn't have the stickiness when it went out onto the job sites. So why is that? Why is that? Why was it not sticky? I'll use the core values as an example. We had six core values at the time, and they were core values that consisted of two to three sentences each. And people couldn't remember them. So so what I did is I, is I got hundred dollar bills and I got known for this because I'd show up on a job site and I would say to people, whoever can recite this certain core value to me word for word, I'll give you a hundred dollars on the spot. And I did that for a couple of years and it didn't work. It, it, it was an incentive for a hundred dollars to remember the core values, but I realized that, that's silly. If I have to, if I have to incentivize people to remember the core values, then it's, it's not, that's not going to work long term. So what did you do then? What did you do to change that? We simplified the core values and we, we simplified the, the, the company focus and our niche. And what are your core values? Our core values are some, very simple. World-class safety, pride in our work, and be respectful and fair. World-class safety, pride in our work, be respectful and fair. That's it. Those are the three. Very Excellent. simple. Yes. Excellent. And how did you simplify your vision? Our vision is broken into two pieces. Our passion. Our passion is outstanding customer service in our niche, complex and demanding infrastructure projects. Interesting. So let me ask you this. How do, how does your vision and your values, how does that affect the way you run your business on a daily basis? It affects our company every day. When I hear somebody say something as a, as a matter of conversation, our customers matter for this reason or that reason. Yesterday, I spoke to a person that works for our company who is having some health problems. So I called him up to see how he's doing. And he, he works in our in our yard. He's the yard guy that, that um, helps to load up trucks for the supplies going out to jobs and things like that. And during the conversation, he I, at the end of the conversation, I asked him, well, what do you got going on now? And he says, well, I'm at work and 
and I'm um, busy doing this business, new job starting up. And he said, so important that we get this job ready for our customers because our customers are so important to us. And I said, you're right. And, and without us having our passion that we talk about, which is part of the core focus, meaning that we have outstanding customer service and we talk about it in most of these 22 service standards, I wouldn't have the guy that works in our yard talking about customers. So there you are with $100 bills and you're like, this is not working because people are not remembering our values. And if they are remembering them, they're just remembering them. So they get a hundred bucks when I walk on the job site. So you simplify them and you, and you simplify your core focus to the customer service and the complex projects, which, you know, is super excellent because it's just a great filter for everything that you do. And now you have these 22 service standards, which is kind of a, an exposition of those things but isn't that sort of another complication of the simplicity that you had just gotten to? Yes, it is. What it does is it pushes it out to our job sites and into our office and into our yard and our shop. And people talk about one of the service standards every morning. And one service standard takes 30 seconds or less to read it. And I explain to people that when I launch it, I launch it with every new employee. I sometimes meet with new groups of employees uh, on Microsoft Teams, or maybe one employee left. Uh, last Friday, I met with one single employee. And I launched the service standards and I explained to them that every morning when, when you're on the job site, we do flex and stretch before we start work and we do a safety meeting to talk about the hazards of the job. And we also talk about one of our service standards. And I encourage you that when you, I tell the people, when, I encourage you that when you hear somebody talk about the service standards or read that service standards, I want you to ask questions if you have questions or make feedback or talk about how you experienced that or something you saw another employee do or say that reflected that service standard. So, so let me, let me just interrupt feedback. you there then. So how many employees do you have? 60. 60. And you have this conversation with each new employee? Yes, I do. Including the laborers in the field? Yes, I do. Okay. So I, I'm just making a note of that. You have 60 employees. So you're not tiny. You're not massive, but you're not tiny. It's not like you have two crews running around doing their thing. Okay. So you begin each day with the flex and stretch, the safety, and then a service standard. And that's driven by your foreman? Correct. Yes. Do you see those service standards reflected in the work that your folks are doing in the field? Yes, I do. What I've seen in the last month, uh, which is fresh in my mind, is that there, there are people that are being called out for quality, poor quality issues. And they're being called out on our core value, which is pride in our work. Right. And, and when we have somebody that doesn't follow core value, we talk to them three times and we explain to them, we're going to, we're going to remind you of the core value the first time we meet with you. And we're going to talk to you about what, what, how you didn't follow the core value. And then we're gonna, we're gonna, if we need to, we're gonna put you on, on an action plan, meaning a corrective action plan right. that we'll work on together for 30 days. We'll meet you on 30 days again. And if we have nothing to talk about in 30 days except for geez, things are going great, then that's good. Right. And then if but yet if we do have something to talk about, we're gonna go another 30 day period and we're gonna check in with you. And if at the end of that 60 days we still have to talk about the corrective actions then you're done. And it's because you chose, you chose yourself to not want to work here because our core values are so straightforward. And we've had some people that have had to leave the company recently because of that. That's not necessarily a bad thing though, because what you're doing then is you're using your core values as a filtering device to attract the right people and to repel the wrong people. That's correct. And it feels good. It feels like it's the company that we used to have in the first eight years. It feels like it's a, a well-run company. That's interesting you said that for the first eight years. I'm assuming as the growth happened, things got a little bit more out of control? Yes, that's correct. But by stating the values and setting out these 22 service standards, that was a way for you to be able to gain more control and, and get more consistency throughout the organization? Yes, absolutely. The 22 service standards reflect our core values and our core focus and our passion and explain how we, how we do the things that we do. Would you mind if we linked to those core standards in the show notes? 
Excellent. So just so you know, we're going to link to them. How did you develop the 22? Is it just like in a, in a flurry of thinking? Did you get together with your key leaders? Did you go out to the mountaintop and just kind of write them down? How did you develop them? I, didn't, I, it, it, I haven't had them for very long. About a year ago, in a leadership meeting, I talked about how I wanted to improve the company culture and I wanted to push it out, out into the field, into the hands of the craft people. I wanted to push it out to the hand of the flagger that's flagging traffic and the carpenter and equipment operator's hands so that they can understand how our business operates. And I wanted them to, to belong, to feel like they belong to something that was making a difference. And I, and I asked myself, if, if this company was to shut down tomorrow, what difference would it make to our customers and what difference would it make to our employees? And, and I thought, I, I, I'm, going, I'm going to develop these service standards. So I, I sat down and I did these by myself. And, and I pushed them out to the leadership group and I asked them for feedback. They gave me a little bit of feedback for clarity on what I needed to change. And then I said, okay, we're going to launch this. And I'm going to launch it first with you, leadership team, where I'm going to facilitate. I'm going to read these one at a time for you. We're going to start on the first business day of the month. We're going to read number one. And we would meet at like 10 of 8 every morning uh, on telephone or, or, or webcam. And then the second business day, we'd read number two. And each time we read one, we I would talk a little bit about it. I would elaborate to say, this is what it means for us to, to be world-class safe. Or this is what it means for, to us to have pride in our work. And would like you give that. like practical examples? Yes, I would. Yes. Okay. Yep. And I encourage them to do the same thing so that when they pushed it out. So then the, after we finished our month, then, then the, the leadership team pushed it out to the group of project managers and estimators and office staff and uh, our equipment manager. Uh, they spent 30 days doing it, or yeah, 30 days, which is 0.2 work days, pushing it out. And then the third month, we pushed it out to the entire company and every, every single crew is doing it. So when you, were, you, you asked me about how do I hold them accountable to do it? I, I think we're doing it, but I don't know. Interesting. I, I've shared with you, but I've, I've been away for a while. I'm, I'm, I'm still in Boston right now. Yeah. Uh, so I've, I've been away from, from the business since March. So you picked the number of 22 because of the 22 days and working days in the month? Or is, is that how you came up with the 22? Yes, 22, okay. 22 business days in every month. So naturally, uh, some months have a little bit less. But and how many months have you been, how long have you been repeating these, so to speak? Five months. Five months. And, and what, what changes, if any, have you noticed in your business in those five months? I've noticed conversations occurring about customers. I, I've noticed people saying that there's something different about our business that's unique. I've had, uh, <clears throat> I, I had a group meeting about a month ago where I was introducing new employees to it. One of the new employees had had his own business in the wastewater industry and uh, worked for his dad for a lot of years. He had 30 some years in the business. He was in the group and there was a a labor in the group. So there was four in the group and in the group, it was discussed that this is unique. This is a unique business. And, and uh, that they, they said it amongst themselves that this is something really interesting and I really like it. So, so initially people hear it and they like it. And as we repeat it, I want people to embrace it and, and use it. And then eventually I want people to give. I want people to give all that they have to give to help us accomplish these things that we talk about every day. Because each one of these 22 service standards relates to something that we need to do in order to create outstanding customer service and to be able to efficiently and effectively build complex and demanding infrastructure work. Okay, so this is fundamental here. Um, and I, I do want people who are listening to, to pay attention to the process. So the process that we've laid out here is that Bill, as the, the president of the company, you develop these 22 service standards you then push them out to your, your senior leaders, repeating them for a month with them. They then push them out to the, uh, the folks in the office that report to them. 
and then they push them out to the folks in the field. And you now have everyone repeat them on the job site one a day um, as, as the month goes by, the working month goes by. And what you're noticing as a result of that is a, a uniqueness, people understanding there's a uniqueness about your business. And, and this is key here, that your service standards are directly related to your ability to execute your, your core focus, which is customer service and building complex projects. Did I hear that all right? Yes, we did. Okay. So it's, it's so important for you listening to this show here to understand the process. You notice that we haven't necessarily dived deeply into the service standards themselves. We will link to them in the show notes. You're going to have to develop your own service standards that are unique to you um, and that relate to your core focus and your strategy. And that's the lesson that you want to learn from just this conversation that Bill and I are having here at the moment. Why do you begin with the customer? The customer is, is the most important thing to our business. We need a customer to have a business. We can have a business, but without a customer, we have nothing. It's the most important thing that we have, and we focus on that. That's excellent. And, and why, why the complex projects? Why not just move some dirt, throw down some asphalt, and on to the next one? The easy jobs draw more competition. They draw 10 or 12 bidders to them. and we. We like to say that when we bid those jobs, if we bid them to win them, we have to think of the mindset of how we, we all used to be 20 years younger, 20 years ago when we used to do that work, and we would put sneakers on. They were still, not literally sneakers on, but we'd be running all day long. Right. And, and we didn't believe that we could sustain that, that pace and continue on. And we didn't want to continue to work for such low margins. With all that high competition, right? So we go into a very strong focus. Say we're picky. No, we're actually we're focused. When we became focused on complex, demanding work, it took away some of our options. Well, some of our options we didn't want anyway. We focus on demanding. We do a lot of wastewater treatment plant reconstruction and new excavation in city streets. We still do pipeline work, but it's eighteen or twenty foot deep in city streets. And uh, it's not out in residential areas or rural areas because we think that, that anybody can do that. Not anybody, but it's, it's not as complex and it draws a lot more competition. We like to say that in our marketing strategy, we say that, that 30% of our work shall have no more than three bidders on it. And what, when we say that to our estimating group, that says that you have to be very focused on the work that we're bidding. And if there's, if we will bid up to eight bidders, but if there's more than eight, we won't bid. I want to make sure that people get that. You communicate to your estimators that 30% of the work that you bid will have no more than three bidders, and you won't bid a project that has more than eight. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And the reason you're picking the complex work is so that you can set yourself apart from the competition and not have to run around with those sneakers on chasing work with, you know, the pack of dirt movers in the, in, in you know, in your area. Of, That's correct. And you know, our capture ratios have increased and our, our gross profit has increased. Interesting. With the new focus there. So again, let me, let me just say this guys, just for you guys who are listening, if you want to increase your hit rate or your capture rate, if you want to increase your gross profit, then get disciplined and focused on a niche that other people can't compete with you on. And, and where you can set yourself apart in terms of your customer service, in terms of the way that you execute the work. Okay. So, so let me just ask you a couple of more questions. How do you balance the tension between customer service and getting the job done and safety and getting the job done. How do you balance that tension? There's not a tension with customer service. Some, sometimes there's, there's tension when a customer creates tension. And I, should, I need to restate that because that, that what I just said happens sometimes on public work. And public work is, is an interesting challenge for us because we believe that the people who work for the government that let our work out to bid, that who we work for, they're all customers. And we have that as one of our, our service standards. Yet sometimes the people that are that 
that we work with, that are employees of ours that we work with on public work, they have different attitudes. They, they, they don't necessarily have the attitude that we're on the same team. Right. And sometimes that there's, there's stress that's created there. And we work hard to work through that. And we, mm-hmm. we, I talk to people, people that work in our company to keep communicating and, and, and um, think of them as customers because they are. They're our customers. And sometimes they create stress because they've worked with so many contractors that don't view them as customers. That, that so many contractors have, have bludgeoned them and, and they don't like work with contractors. So that, that we, have, we all have a bad reputation with some people. Let me ask you this then, in, in that public work where I'm assuming, generally speaking, it's a hard bid environment, is that right? Yes, it is. Hard bid. Low better takes all. Okay, so then has, has your, your philosophy of treating even the government customers as customers, has that, how has that impacted your business in terms of being able to develop long-term relationships, get repeat business? Has that impacted it at all from the public side of the, the house? It has, absolutely. Because it doesn't impact us so much with the public customer. It impacts us with the engineering firms and the architects that we work with that manage that work. Because those are people that are going to recommend us for future work that isn't hard bid. And we've gotten a lot of work that way. That's the key insight right there. So, so you may think that these public customers are a pain in the neck and they're just government employees, but it's not just them. See, this is another thing. You're not just selling to, your, to, to the people who you're building for. You're selling to all the people associated with the project, all the engineers, the architects, everyone involved in the project. As we wrap up, what advice would you give to a construction company president CEO who's listening to this in light of developing their own service standards, what advice would you give to them? I, the advice I'm going to give is, is, is the mindset that I had when I developed. The advice is, is to think about what, what you want your company to look, look like and how you would describe it to people that work for you and use that as an outline and also think about what's missing in your company. What, what, what is missing in your company that you yourself would be communicating to people if you were out on the jobs, interacting and communicating with all the people on your jobs every day? What's missing? And then see if you can fit that in, into a service standard and communicate that every month. So three things that I picked up there. If you want to develop your own service standards, first ask, what do you want your company to look like? How would you describe that to the people who work for you? And then what's missing when you look at your company that you would like to instill in the organization? Did I hear that right? Yes, you did hear that right. Now, now what, I, what I do want to say this, when, it's very interesting because when you're describing those service standards, it's, it's an internal focus. These aren't necessarily marketing slogans that you're looking to push out into the world, but you're looking to describe these service standards in terms that your people would understand. Yes, correct. And then also, yeah, that's very, that's very, very important there. Okay, so I, I just want to make sure that everyone gets those three things. What would you like your company to look like? How would you describe it to people in your company who work for you? And in order to develop some of those standards, what's missing that you would like to implement into the company? And what's interesting about what you've done here, Bill, and maybe we can start a movement here of, of the 22 service standards, is you've got one service standard for each day, which is then communicated on a regular basis, because that repetition obviously is so important. That's correct. I learned that when I don't con- consistently talk about vision, and core focus and core values that they blur, they they disappear over time, and people don't pay attention to them. So we talk about them every every month. We're talking about one of the twenty two. Twelve times a year, everybody's going to hear every single one of them. Okay, and so this is key, right? Twelve times a year, they're going to see it and hear it. Repetition is essential. And then another thing that I picked up earlier in our conversation is being able to state the core service standard and then tie it into a practical example. Give them a practical hook that they can then see this is how this service standard is expressed. And therefore, this is an idea of how I can be expressing it as well. Yes. Yeah, this is very good. Okay. Bill, I really appreciate the insights. Again, 
we, we didn't really dive into the nuts and bolts of the service standards. I will post that in the show notes so that you can look at it. The point is, you as a construction company owner, you need to develop your own service standards. If you can get to 22, that would be sweet because you've got one a month. And we laid out the perspective that you should bring to the table when you're looking to develop them for yourself. So let me ask you this. Would you recommend, let's say you're in a partnership, obviously you would get together with your partner and, and do it together. Would that be something you would, you would recommend? Yeah, I would. I would recommend that because I, I do believe that the people that are going to lead the effort need to believe in it themselves that, and have yep. to be a reflection of them and what they believe in. And so when you pushed it out to your executive team, did you take some of the feedback and edit or adjust the standards from that feedback? Yeah, there wasn't a lot of feedback, but yes, I did. And, and they were all part of it. They, before we launched it, before I even launched it with them, we reviewed it on what my drafts were. And did you get any eye rolling in the executive meeting? Sort of, this is just blah, blah, blah. Let's go build the work. Not at all. I, it, Interesting. It was, it was very well received. So let me ask you just final question here. What is your long-term goal for your business? We have a 10-year focus and uh, a 10-year target. So in 2030, we want to do revenue of 65 million. We want to do year-round work. So up here in in the Northeast, we shut down. We work maybe nine months out of the year. We want year-round work, which means we're going to be changing work types to accommodate that. We want overhead matches net profit. So whatever our overhead is, I want to match the net profit. In other words, d- double the overhead for me, and then I'll get my net profit. Where, why are you using that framework of overhead matching net profit? Because it's simple. Because some, sometimes I say, okay, I, I might want five or seven or eight or 10%, and it keeps varying depending on, on what our, our overhead expenses are. And I just say, for simplicity moving forward, for us to be able to easily remember this, if the overhead is a million dollars, then I want a million dollars of, of net profit. profit. Yeah. yeah. That's a challenging one, isn't it? It's a challenging one, but that's, that's what I want in 10 years. I want it to be simple and easy to understand and, and achievable. Interesting. So, so you believe it's achievable then? I believe it's achievable. It's achievable. And we want outstanding company culture. So that's, that's our, our 10-year plan. It's very simple. As I just stated, it's got four bullet points. And uh, on a personal level, I want to be here for at least 10 more years working in the business. We've been working on succession for about 10 years. And I have uh, three people that I'm working with on that. Um, I'm staging it. I have somebody that I'm going to be selling some some non-voting stock to. And I have some people that I am doing phantom stock with as, as entry level. You're doing what stock? Phantom stock. Phantom stock. Okay. Interesting. That's, I think that's another discussion is um, I'd love to be able to have another discussion with you about your succession planning, but I just, I just want to just to restate this, right? So 20 by in 10 years, you want to be doing 65 million, your overhead and your, your net profit is matching. You want to do year round work. And what's interesting is that you're not looking to expand your geography in order to, to achieve that, but you're, you're looking to expand your, your job mix. Did I hear that right? Yes, correct. And then you want to be able to have outstanding company culture. Yes. And I'm assuming that the 22 service standards are going to be driving that outstanding company culture. Absolutely. When we develop a 10-year plan, like I described, it's so simple. And we look at the goal. One of the goals is outstanding company culture. We break it down into very easily accomplished sub-goals. And one of them is to, to launch these service standards. Excellent. Excellent. Bill, I really appreciate your time here. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun. And, uh, and, and thank you for joining me. I, I, I really do appreciate it. And let's get you back on the show to talk about the succession planning at some point. Would that be okay? Yeah, let's do that. That's awesome. Thank you for listening to this episode of Construction Genius. Hope you found that 1% of inspiration to help you in the next few days. If you like the show, please give us a five-star review on iTunes. Share it with other construction leaders who you think would benefit. And always remember that the show is brought to you by Kick-Ass Meetings. I've been working with construction leaders since 2004, teaching them how to run extremely effective problem-solving meetings that gets their people collaborating, taps into their creativity, and to get yourself a free copy of the Kick-Ass Meeting Report, 
go to www.ericanderton.com slash kickassmeetings. Grab yourself that free report, read it, use it in your business. You'll find it extremely useful. And thanks again for listening.